Hey everybody, thanks for joining us again on Celebrating Act Two. As you can see, Art and I are with that fabulous food and travel writer, John Mariani, who by the way, was one of America's premier food writers, a three-time nominee for the James Beard Journalism Award. Big deal, big deal. Used to be. So I have a question for you today, John. Um... With uh, we're out of, well out of the pandemic uh, crises and people are out out and about and doing everything without masks and and uh, I see people in regular restaurants so on and so forth. But the fine dining world, um, how's that faring now that people are getting back into the world? Just great. Hmm. <laughs> Would you like me to elaborate? Please. Oh, no, that's enough. To our audience, just that's great. It. Have a nice trust day. Me on this. <laughs> uh, well, I'm glad to hear it. Yeah. Well, I'm glad to hear it, too, because those are the places I kind of like to go to. Um, the, one of the problems is that the media, all the media, whether it's newspapers or magazines, especially the food, <clears throat> food and wine media, um, when COVID hit, it was this flurry of, oh, boy, all restaurants are going to go out of business. Then, well, the fine dining restaurants are going to go out. I mean, who who wants to go to these fussy places? Who wants a tablecloth? Who wants good thin wine glasses and have to pay for it? And then you know, it, 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 it's just nobody's going to want to do that after COVID. Well, we got through COVID. Restaurants got through COVID. Did some close? Yes, they close on every strike from fast food restaurants up to fine dining. There's always re different reasons why restaurants close. Uh, a lot of it has to do with the landlord. A lot of it has to do with the guy who gets divorced from his, his uh, wife or chef and so forth. <clears throat> but after the pandemic, um, things came back much more quickly than I would have anticipated. Many were delayed. Now, um, let me talk about Le Bernardin. Le Bernardin, which just got four stars from the New York Times and has three Michelin stars, it's, it's considered one of the greatest restaurants in America. Uh, it opened tentatively when COVID ended, but they didn't open for lunch at first because they're in a uh, um, they're in New York on uh, 53rd Street, 52nd Street, uh, in a big um, uh, building, uh, office building, and there was nobody in the offices. Now, those are the people who used to come to lunch. So there weren't there there wasn't any lunch business to say. Dinner was jammed. You couldn't get into the place uh, weeks in advance. Gradually they're back for lunch now, and again they are jammed. Now I use that as only one example in New York because of the uh, highest end French restaurants, places like Le Pavillon, places like Danielle, places like Jean Georges, places like Le Bernardin. La Granui, uh, what people call the Le and La restaurants, they are doing just fine. I mean, I challenge you to pick up your phone right now and try to make a reservation within the next week or more, and they will be packed, absolutely packed. Sorry, we, we, we're taking reservations for April now, okay? Now, um, around the country, and we'll get to Europe in a moment, but around the country, including California, where you guys are, uh, fine dining has long before COVID, uh, it was eclipsed by a slew of new restaurants, which the media out there widely, roundly um, uh, raved about. Uh, at the same time, they would put the kibosh on fine dining, even though the Hollywood crowd still go to Spago, they still go to Mr. Chow's, they still go to all of the, the, the restaurants and the Beverly Hills Hotel and so forth. They're always going there. Okay, but California and much of the United States now prides itself on having uh, taken down that aspect of refinery and how do you have to act and how do you have to dress and nobody's going to tell me to put on a jacket sort of thing. That's my right to come in looking like Adam Sandler with my hat backwards to a, a great restaurant. Um, oh, white tablecloths. What? Why? I'm terrified by them. Oh, yeah, well, white tablecloths, tablecloths of any color exist for lots of reasons. They're sanitary, very hygienic. They're changed all the time. Um, they have a nice soft glow. They throw light. And it is what 
a little Thai restaurant in Encino uh, used to have, uh, maybe topped with glass or, or something. Um, all, oh, fine, so we're paying for all of that. We're paying for all that. Why am I paying uh, for $34 for a chicken when I can get it at Poco Loco for 12 Um it's a ridiculous comparison, as with anything uh, to do with finery and luxury. So um, the rest of the country revels in these rungs below the high fine dining level, although you could spend just as much money at, uh, at a sushi restaurant in, in Los Angeles, just as much money as the most expensive restaurant in the United States, very, very eagerly. And Robert De Niro will be sitting over there and so forth. Um, so that's illusory about the money spent. There also has come a cropper, the idea that these are elitist places. Therefore, one should not go to them. One should instead wait on a line for an hour and a half to get into a 12 seat Cambodian restaurant in a, in a, a section of town you never ever want to go to otherwise <laughs> and to sit in a loud lastingly loud restaurant where they're serving absolutely delicious Cambodian food and uh, you're sitting there probably at a communal table at a wooden table which is may or may not be wiped down from the last 500 people there were, that were there and now if you look at uh, any of the media, what they are covering uh, uh, in every way as seriously as they did before, a taqueria, wonderful taquerias, a Cambodian restaurant, a Nicaraguan restaurant, a Korean hot pot, a hot pot restaurant, a Nigerian restaurant. Um, uh, what was it? Um, uh, Eater.com said that fine dining is on its way back via West Africa. West Africa. Uh, a lot going to have a lot of West African restaurants coming. Just went, I was supposed to have a lot of Nordic restaurants, <laughs> went downhill. Peruvian restaurants, whoa! Uh, these are because the media, we the media, have to write about stuff 52 weeks a year. Right? But to get back to <clears throat> um, fine dining, how it's faring very well, as I said, in New York, uh, in Paris, in Rome, in London, all of the finest, I'm not even saying the best, but the fine dining restaurants uh, are doing extremely well. And again, you can not get into them on short notice, except maybe at lunch, whether you're going to the Dorchester in London or you're trying to get into Arpege, which is a vegetarian restaurant in Paris that charges about $425 fixed price. You can't get into them. Right? So um, having said this, Let's look at the American Steakhouse, which I'm going to be talking about in another segment of this. The American Steakhouse across America is a very expensive deal. Uh, prices have gone up for all ingredients. Uh, prices have gone up for labor. I mean, in post post COVID days, there's all sorts of economic reasons why prices have gone up. They've gone up on cars and lampshades and everything else. Let's face it. The American Steakhouse, you go there, you know you're going to be getting a steak for $50 and up. Okay, You're going to be getting a veal chop for $45. You're going to get a get tomahawk steak for maybe $90. Okay? There seems to be no resistance to that. Every steakhouse I go to here in New York or anywhere else, where it's St. Elmo's in Indianapolis, it, five, they open the doors at 5.30, place fills up by 6, there's another turnover at 8, and there'll be some stragglers coming in from the theater and stuff like at 10, 10.30. 365 days a year. The wines, they have a thousand label wine list over here, um, which is, you know, they wouldn't be stocking all of those wines if they weren't selling them. So while the, and largely speaking, steak houses still do have tablecloths. Um, all I'm saying, and I'll, as I said, I'll talk about this in another segment, uh, but what I'm saying is that it's not a question of price. It's not a question of, well, I don't want to go to that restaurant that, with a French name because it's going to cost me $150 a person or more. Look, you could spend $900 a person at Noma in Copenhagen. So price is not the object unless you really can't afford the price. 
but there are also special enough special occasions where you want to blow a little money on your wife or significant others. So you say, okay, we're going to have a $500 meal tonight. There's more than enough those people celebrating anniversaries and birthdays and and uh, everything else to fill these uh, fill these rooms. So no, uh, fine dining restaurants are not in danger. Very very few at least by comparison to lesser restaurants, went out of business uh, during, well, well, some did during COVID because they just couldn't survive for two years. But by and large, they did not, and they regrouped. And how can we keep prices in line? And how can we keep com people coming back? And they do because people think they're getting value for their money or they go for other reasons, like because they're just very beautiful places um, and you'll get very good service. So, um, no, I'm in no. Uh, I'm a little. I am worried about you guys out there in Southern California, frankly, because uh, I think that the idea of fine dining, uh, which you had when you used to have absolutely exquisite restaurants like L'Orangerie and Le Dome and L'Hermitage and Valentino, the great, the, you know, the greatest Italian restaurants in the world, and Rex, uh, another great Italian restaurant, all gone. Well, can't help you, pal, if you don't want to go to those restaurants out there and you just want to hang out at a sushi bar and spend $300 a person, you go right ahead. I will go to uh, Le, Le Bernardin uh, for my wife's uh, birthday next weekend, pay the freight for what I know is going to be a gorgeous and wonderful e romantic evening. It's interesting, John, that you, uh, you mentioned what I call that level just below fine dining. It's the, you know, excellent restaurant, uh, but it's not quite that one unique um, uh, Le Bernardin of, uh, of you know, four-star uh, Michelin Guide uh, kind of restaurant. And those that next tier, which is pretty much where we go to dinner, um, that's that's become very expensive as well. Um, well, look at a place that's not fine dining, like Dan Tanner's in Hollywood. I mean, that place has been around for 50, 60 years and it's going to be jammed every night. Um, uh, what's it? Uh, Nate and Al's, Nate and Al's Grill it goes back to the 1930s. At lunch, the place is packed. And it's not all just Hollywood stars, obviously, but um, there you go. <laughs> okay. So, so fine dining, fine, fine dining. Uh, don't cry for me, fine dining. Uh, fine dining is back. And back I never went away, other than it, some it, of the daytime. Never, it was rising fast in the 1970s and 80s across America. And even second and third tier cities like Indianapolis were opening one or two really terrific restaurants back in the 70s. It was, so, it was a time of new American cuisine um, and these young, brilliant stars, uh, mm -hmm. people like Jeremiah Tower and Mark Miller out there in California uh, doing new Southwest and, and, and uh, new, um, new New England food. It was a very exciting time. And those, those chefs are still around, but they're generally now uh, running lesser restaurants. Good restaurants, I'd go to in a minute. But uh, uh, and, and again, I'm I'm not putting down the Cambodian restaurants and the taquerias. I eat at them constantly, report on them constantly. This 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 week in uh, my virtual gourmet, I wrote about, about a place called Ixta, which is a, a new modern um, uh, Mexican restaurant. Uh, next week, Orienta, which is in Greenwich, Connecticut, which is a Pacific um, Asian French restaurant. Yeah. Um, so I go to them all the time. I love to do so. Well, thank you for John, the update. Appreciate, appreciate the update. My pleasure. For more on Celebrating Act Two, visit our webpage, follow us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and tell your friends. Celebrating Act Two is the user manual for the second half of your life.